It's typically that deadlock over major issues of the day. It's that deadlock that encourages Congress to kick the can down the road in the first place, mostly to avoid blame for failing to reach a decision. So not surprisingly, then, commissions and committees tend to inherit, uh, inherit the stalemate that created them in the first place. And in today's context, when we think about the politics that lead to stalemate, we really have in mind this sort of intense and increasing partisan polarization, both increasing policy differences between the parties, as well as sort of simple partisan team play uh, that gives the parties sort of these strategic reasons to disagree with one another. Parties see the problems differently, they see solutions differently, and even when they can agree on solutions, sometimes they still have this incentive to disagree just because it's, just the, it's the other party. So political incentives for legislators uh, create these uh, commissions in the first place, and then not surprisingly, these commissions uh, find it hard to overcome the politics that created them uh, at the beginning. Second, I think there's a set of institutional reasons why these commissions tend not to work. They are typically, not always, but they're typically created by executive order, not like the Joint Committee, which is created, uh, has a statutory basis, that is, it's written into law. And typically, when presidents set up these commissions through executive orders, they are, as Ron suggested, given a supermajority requirement in order to officially uh, report. Their provisions are rarely, uh, if ever, uh, protected procedurally. That is, they're subject to filibusters. They're subject to party control of the agenda on the House floor. And in fact, the most successful commission is the one, is really the exception that proves the rule. So the defense-based closing commission had a statutory basis. It was protected procedurally uh, from being amended on the floor. And in fact, the decisions of the commission went into effect unless Congress and the president voted to disapprove or to reject the, uh, reject the recommendations. Now, commissions created by executive order, they can't have these legislative authority. And so right off the bat, most of these commissions are hampered by the way in which they're created. Finally, just in terms of contextual reasons why things tend not uh, to succeed here, these episodes are rarely created. Commissions are rarely created in periods of crisis. And even if there was crisis, typically crisis might be uh, necessary to get an agreement, but it's rarely sufficient to compel the parties to sit down. Okay, so, so how is this super committee uh, different than what we've seen uh, historically? It differs primarily in terms of these institutional factors uh, that I've mentioned. Uh, first, it has a statutory basis. As Ron said, it only has a majority vote uh, to report, no amendments on the floor, no filibusters from the right, no filibusters from the left, and the House Rules Committee can't hold a bill off of the floor. And, of course, there are triggers written into the law as well. So, granted, Congress has once again kicked the can down the road, but they've rigged it so that the can explodes if they fail to reach an agreement. Now, uh, why is that important? Right? That, that trigger here, it, it affects the consequences of failing to agree. And typically, the consequences of stalemate, right, some parties welcome the stalemate right, because they may benefit electorally uh, uh, from refusing to agree. This time, the cost to stalemate is much higher, or at least we think it is uh, much <coughs> higher. We think it may compel <coughs> by the committee, at least, uh, not, not to deadlock. Having said that, with all these procedural advantages, the political factors that lead to defeat uh, and failure are, are essentially still, still in place. 